Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with a video all about my favorite epic poetry. I have been planning uh, a video like this for quite some time, but I thought it fit in very well with Ancient Sathon. My favorite epic poem is actually one that was written in the modern day, so it doesn't actually count for Ancient Sathon, but the majority of the rest do. Uh, and so this is really not an exhaustive list at all. I could sit here and talk to you about epic poetry for hours and hours, and even epic poetry that I don't consider an all-time favorite it tends to be something that I genuinely liked. I love the style of epic poetry. Epic poetry, if you don't know, is long-form poetry that kind of follows a narrative, and it tends to be epic in scope. It follows kind of larger-than-life characters most of the time, uh, and so there are some really good big examples of this that I am definitely going to include on this list and I hope a few others that are a little bit lesser known. Uh, but for the most part, some of my favorite works of all time are all works of epic poetry. Of course, I sit down to film so the clouds come out. It's like 95 degrees outside. It's really hot as you might can see. And so, of course, the clouds come in as I start to film. So I do apologize for the lighting. I thought we could go kind of chronologically, we could kind of go in age order. I really wanted to limit myself and only give myself one from each kind of broader time period, but that just sadly is not doable with me, especially in the ancient period. But I did only pick one ancient Greek uh, epic poem. I think we all know where I'm gonna go with this. This is one of the first epic poems, and it is one of the most famous, uh, and that is The Iliad by Homer. Now, when it comes to Homer, you can go one of two ways. You're either really team Iliad or your team Odyssey. And I think most people fall pretty firmly on the side of the Odyssey. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. The Odyssey is an easier book to teach uh, if you are a teacher. And so it is often the work that people are most exposed to in school. Uh, and so sometimes students never even come across the Iliad in their studies. The Iliad is a very confusing work because it drops you in literally in the middle of things in a way that most other epic poetry does not. Most epic poetry does start in media res, which does mean the middle of things. But the Iliad is a very extreme example of that because it is technically one part of a larger whole. It's just the part we have. And, and so the Iliad can be hard to teach. It can be difficult to learn. And so it is something that a lot of students don't come across anymore, sad to say, uh, unless you are studying ancient Greek. I think this is apparently very popular in ancient Greek translation courses. The Iliad has always been my favorite of the two between the Iliad and the Odyssey. I do not care for the Odyssey. A lot of that has to do with the fact that it's been overplayed to me. I studied it, I think, at least three times when I was in college. And I know I studied it at least once in high school. And so I just am bored by it. I'm over it. I've heard it too many times. And I hate Odysseus as a person. Uh, now, you hate a lot of the characters in the Iliad. The Iliad is following the Trojan War, but specifically, it is at the end of the Trojan War, the end of the 10 years. And so there is a lot of drama ongoing in this. I think this is one of the most beautifully written poems I've ever read. Uh, and it stands true in most translations of the Iliad that I have read. To me, this is beautiful in a way that the Odyssey is not. One of my all-time favorite scenes in literature, not just in epic poetry, not just in ancient classics, but just in literature, is in the Iliad. And it is when King Priam of Troy asks Achilles for the body of his son, Hector. I think it is some of the most beautiful and moving writing that I have ever read. In terms of translations, a lot of people love this Robert Fagel's translation. I am kind of partial to the Alexander Pope translation, which I know is not very accurate at all, but it's incredibly beautiful and it translates it into rhyme. 
which I really like. Now, the Iliad is written in meter in a dactylic hexameter, which does mean it has a pattern to the way it is read, and so it might be really fun if you have never read the Iliad before. I highly suggest you do this with all poetry, but specifically epic poetry, I think, benefits from being read aloud. And so I think you should try and read a little bit of this aloud. I think that gives it some charm that it might not have when you're just reading the words on the page. Moving on from that, we're kind of going to move into a sister epic of the Iliad. And this is an epic poem of the ancient Roman Empire. And I think once again, we know where I'm going with this one. Uh, and this is the Aeneid by Virgil. And I will fully admit that I have a lot of bias when it comes to Virgil. Uh, as a Latin student, I spent the last semester of Latin that I took in college uh, translating the Aeneid. Now, we didn't translate it in full, and I really hated it throughout that entire process, and Virgil very famously wanted this burned because he didn't really complete it upon his death, and that was really his dying wish, was that this text be burnt because he wasn't proud of it. And there were many, many days when I was in Latin class trying to translate him that I also wished he had burnt it. But at the end of the experience, after working with translating it for so many months, you have developed a bond with Virgil. If not with the Aeneid, you have developed a bond with Virgil. And it's just a really special thing. And so I recognize my relationship to the Aeneid is not the relationship that everybody else has. Uh, and so you often see, because this is kind of carrying on immediately from the Iliad, it follows Aeneas, uh, who fled the city of Troy. And in this poem, he kind of founds the city of Rome. So you'll find a lot of people saying Virgil is just not as good as Homer. The Iliad is retold in this quite a bit to kind of give context for Aeneas' story, why he is in exile. And for my money, for my money, the retelling of the Trojan War that is in the Aeneid is even better than the Iliad. And I say that as somebody who's really into the Iliad, I really enjoy the Iliad, but the Aeneid is something special. And again, I know I just bonded with it as a Latin student. There's so much weird Latin in the Aeneid that you work with it in just a very interesting way in terms of translation. I think you work with it in a way that you don't other texts because he did such interesting things with certain characters. Certain characters speak in very grammatically incorrect Latin, which is very frustrating as a student, but I think allowed me to not only love the story, which I love anyway, but to really love Virgil and appreciate the work that Virgil put into this. So this is written around the time that the Republic falls and the Empire rises during uh, the Emperor Augustus's reign. Uh, and there is a really interesting political backstory to this as well and why it was written at the time that it was written. But uh, it's just a very interesting and fun poem to read on its own. And the characters are amazing. There is a female character in this, Dido. I love her so much. And some of my interest in this and some of my love for this almost has nothing to do with the fact that I was a Latin student who worked with it. It's because I really love Dante. Uh, and Dante, I think, loves Virgil so much that whenever you read Dante, you immediately want to read Virgil and you want to know what he's talking about. And so I think I was always destined to really like Virgil. Uh, but this is definitely in my top, maybe five, top five epic poems. We then have the Metamorphoses by Ovid, and Ovid is one of my favorite poets from the ancient period. In fact, he might be my favorite because I really like a lot of what Ovid did aside from the Metamorphoses. He is, again, an author that I came across quite a bit in Latin class, and he is one that really made me interrogate my relationship with translation because you often hear from people who uh, are bilingual when they read a book in the original language and then read it in a translation, they often talk about how much is lost in translation. And, and I never really understood that, of course, because I only speak English. But working with Ovid in Latin class, I do understand that there is a beauty to Ovid in Latin that I think is very, very hard to translate. The Metamorphoses is a really good example of that. It's very, very beautiful in translation, but there are parts of it that I have read in Latin when I was a student, and it just is very 
very stunning and very beautiful. And I think you often also understand kind of the hardship of translation when you do translate something and you're in a class with everyone and everybody translates it slightly differently. Some people's translations are beautiful. Others are very clunky. Uh, and so Ovid is one that can go one of two ways for me. Sometimes I feel like translations of him are not very well done, but other times I really like the translations of him. And so I'm willing to read anything once just to try it. I don't have a favorite translator of Ovid, but The Metamorphoses is his poem about kind of Greek and Roman mythology. And he goes from the creation of the world up to Julius Caesar being deified. And Ovid is writing at a similar time to Virgil, which is the reign of Emperor Augustus. So akin to the Aeneid, there is also a really interesting political background to Ovid's writing and the Metamorphoses specifically. The Metamorphoses is an enjoyable read and it is one of my favorites, but I think for me, I enjoy the Metamorphoses more for what it did than what it is, if that makes any sense. The Metamorphoses is the basis of so much in Western culture and Western literature, Western art, let's say. Shakespeare, for example, was very inspired by the Metamorphoses. Bernini, for example, his sculpture is on the cover here, Apollo and Daphne, one of my favorite sculptures of all time. Uh, he is not the only Renaissance Baroque artist that took inspiration from this. Uh, this is one of the foundational texts of the Western canon to me, and also of Western art. And I think if you're really interested uh, in stuff like that, in the basis of things, things that were inspirations for other artists, this is definitely one that you want to read uh, because this is just very prevalent even in the modern day in terms of inspiration just because it has very, very long legs. And so this is one that I highly recommend. I really enjoy it, but I think it's really enjoyable for what it has inspired others to do even more than just the text itself, if that makes sense. Let's talk about The Civil War by Lucan. I know this is not everyone's favorite, okay? I get it. This is a weird one, and a lot of people think this was written in very strange Latin, that it translates very oddly. I love this. Uh, Lucan was writing in the age of Nero, if I'm not mistaken, so he's a little bit later than Ovid. Uh, and Virgil, and he is also a very interesting political figure, uh, and his writings are very interesting politically. And so The Civil War is an epic poem about Caesar's civil war, Julius Caesar's civil war. So it's very interesting politically and historically because it is not only commenting on Julius Caesar's civil war, but it is commenting on the Roman Empire that Lucan currently lives in, uh, which is very dangerous for Lucan, as it turns out. I just really love this, and I kind of find it strange because when I look at other reviews, it seems like so many readers had a lot of problems with this. And yet, for me, it's just a really fun and engaging read. Uh, and this might be more, let's say, popular fiction when we're talking about epic poetry. This may be more popular fiction uh, than kind of literary fiction, the literary fiction of the Aeneid uh, or the Metamorphoses. This is very action-packed, and I think it's just a whole lot of fun to read. So this is another of my favorites. I wouldn't say it's in my top five, and I might not even say that it's in my top 10, but it is one that I have always had a real fondness for. The medieval period, I do only have one option for. I had so many that I wanted to talk about, and frankly, the medieval period in terms of epic poetry could be its own video. Uh, there were a lot of bangers <laughs> coming out in the medieval period in terms of epic poetry, but we can't just skip over the period entirely uh, because this is my favorite epic poem, I will say, other than the one that I'm going to talk about at the end. But this is my favorite, and that is Dante's Divine Comedy. Who would I be if I didn't mention Dante in this video? Uh, so Dante was writing in the 1300s. He is an Italian poet, and this is quite revolutionary in a lot of respects because it was written in the vernacular of the time, vernacular Italian. The reason that it is remarkable that an Italian poet would write in Italian uh, is that most of the time, literature and poetry was written in Latin at this time period. And so there is something very innovative about Dante uh, from that aspect, but it's also a really 
dreamy compilation of everything that Dante is particularly interested in as a person. And so the Divine Comedy's storyline uh, is that Dante himself is a character in this poem and he is being led through the Christian afterlife. He goes through hell, purgatory, and then heaven, and he is guided by uh, the ancient poet Virgil uh, through hell and purgatory, and then he is guided by his muse kind of the love of his life, let's say Beatrice uh, in heaven. And so this is, I think, truly the most brilliantly written piece of literature that I have ever read. I just truly sometimes have to sit and marvel at the majesty of this work because everything that went into it is just amazing to me. It's written in Terza Rima, which is a very interesting rhyme scheme. It's not always translated as being in that rhyme scheme. It's apparently very hard to translate that into English. So there is definitely a meter to it, as there is with most epic poetry. But Dante folds in historical figures, religious figures, figures from his own personal life, family members, political figures of his own day. He condemns to certain parts of hell or he rises to certain places in heaven. His vision of the Christian afterlife is so amazing, really, that it is still one of the most prevalent images of the Christian afterlife today. The characterization is insane to me. I remember reading for the very first time when Dante and Virgil had to part ways. Virgil cannot enter heaven because uh, he's a pagan. And you as the reader have fallen in love with Virgil a little bit while you spent time with him alongside Dante in this poem. Virgil is just this really beautiful voice of reason throughout the first two parts of the Divine Comedy. And I remember reading for the first time when they parted ways and I actually cried and it, was the first time that a poem had ever touched me like that. And I still think about it sometimes. It is just remarkable to me that a work of poetry, not a work of just fiction, not a novel, truly a work of poetry, moved me to tears by the characterization and not just the beauty of the language. Uh, and so there's also really beautiful language here. The Divine Comedy is my favorite epic poem of all time. We then have a recent favorite for me, which is The Liberation of Jerusalem by Torquato Tasso. This is also an Italian epic poem. It was written in the 1500s, and it focuses on the First Crusade. This is so dreamy. I mean, truly, this is one of the dreamiest poems that you will ever read. The rhyme scheme is stunning. And sometimes you do get the sense, even when you can't read the original, you do get the sense that something was translated very well. And that was the feeling that I got here. This translation is by Max Wickert. And I just really felt like he got to the heart of what this poem was about. I mean, listen to this. O oh, memory, time's foe, oblivion's shame, guardian and steward of all deeds of might, lend me your force of mind that I may name each leader and each company aright. Resound and illustrate their ancient fame, already dulled by years and dimmed by night. Yield me your treasure, beautify my tongue, to keep them for all time forever young. I'm a sucker, I am a sucker. For you invoking the muses in epic poetry. And so this is a really, really beautiful one. I also like the setting of the Crusades. There's something very epic here that I just really enjoy. And it feels epic in a classical sense. And it feels like it really harkens back to Homer or to the Aeneid, uh, which I really like and I find kind of refreshing. So this is a recent favorite of mine and I highly recommend it. One of my perennial favorites is The Fairy Queen. I am due for a reread of this, I know. And this is The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. I wish that I had an edition of this that had all of the cantos in it because this one does not. I have been told the Penguin does do a full edition of The Fairy Queen, so I need to get my hands on that if I ever wanna reread this. This is a dreamy Elizabethan era uh, epic poem that is very allegorical. Uh, and so it's very heavy on knights and chivalry. King Arthur plays a role in this. And all of these figures and characters often stand in for something else. So the fairy queen herself 
is a stand-in for Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth. The fun and the joy of this one is that you have to put the puzzle pieces together. Uh, and so I think you kind of enjoy dissecting who everybody is, what things stand in for what, because allegory can be kind of fun. Even though it can be heavy handed, it can also be a really enjoyable experience. And the Fairy Queen is one that I read quite a bit when I was in university. And so there was always just a real lighthearted quality to class when you were studying this one. I love the meter and the rhyme scheme in this. This is another of the most beautifully written poems in my opinion. It is very, very long uh, and that intimidates a lot of people. I think the time period in which it was written also intimidates a lot of people. Uh, and so this is maybe not the one to start with if you're looking to start with epic poetry, but I just don't think this will disappoint you. This one is so rewarding. Uh, not only is it long, so when you get to the end of it, you feel like you've really accomplished something, but you also just enjoy the ride of it so much. It's very fairy tale like and just, again, very dreamy. This poem definitely goes for an aesthetic, and I think it's very, very successful uh, in that aesthetic. So, this is one that I really love. We're almost at the end, we're in my last three, and this next one is another that's in my top five. And it was my second favorite epic poem for many, many years. It's been unseated uh, by two more on this list, but it's still in my top five. That is Paradise Lost by John Milton. I truly think this is one of the masterworks of English literature. This is one of a handful on my favorites list that was actually written in English. And so I'm not reading it through a translator, uh, which I think aids it, I think makes it a very fun experience when you really like epic poetry. This is one that I really enjoy because I got to experience it firsthand and not through kind of the funnel of a translator. But this is focusing on Satan or Lucifer and the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. And so this really fills in the blanks of the book of Genesis in the Bible uh, and kind of sets up the snake in the Garden of Eden. Paradise Lost is the source of a lot of what we think we know uh, about the creation story and also just Genesis in general uh, because I think most people think Adam and Eve took a bite of an apple uh, off a tree and that really shows up here. John Milton names it as an apple. People also interpret the snake in the Garden of Eden to be Satan. He is Satan in Paradise Lost, but in the Bible, it's never actually mentioned that the serpent is Satan. You know the old phrase, the old Rolling Stones song, Sympathy for the Devil? That's what Paradise Lost is all about. Uh, it's very much making you sympathetic to the figure of Lucifer. And so at a certain point, you feel sorry for him. And that's really the brilliance of the poem. I imagine this is a very uncomfortable read when it was originally published. I would go back to school tomorrow if I could take a course just entirely dedicated to Paradise Lost. The most famous line from this uh, is when he says, it's better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. When I read that for the first time, I just thought it was really incendiary. There is something about this that's very electrifying even today, but I imagine this was a very, very contentious read when it was first published in the 1600s. And so this one is still in my top five, but it has moved out of the spot of top two for me. Uh, so it has been edged out by the last two that I'm going to talk about today. Moving on through time, we kind of skipped the 1700s. I don't know of many epic poems from the 1700s. I'm sure there are some, but I don't know that I've ever read any. But moving into the 1800s, we have Child Harold's Pilgrimage by Lord Byron. This is now, I wanna say, I feel like this is now my second favorite epic poem. This is about Child Harold kind of going on his grand tour of Europe. Uh, and in many ways, Child Harold stands in for Lord Byron. It's a very emo poem. This is a poem that you want to read while you're listening to My Chemical Romance or Fallout Boy, uh, and you're really in touch with your emotions. There is a real emo side to this, specifically in the first two cantos. But Lord Byron published this across a couple of years. And so the first two cantos were published earlier in his career. The second two, the last two, were published after he became more successful. So the tone 
of the second two cantos is really interesting, Canto 3 and 4. It becomes more of a travelogue and it becomes more of Lord Byron waxing poetic on all of the places that he's been uh, and places that he really enjoys. The reason this is my favorite and the reason it really entered kind of my favorites list automatically is Canto 4, which is dedicated entirely to Italy. It is some of the most gorgeous poetry I've ever read. Uh, and there are so many instances where I just scribbled on the page, underlined everything. I don't even have a favorite part of this anymore. It's just so good. I have come back and reread parts of this many, many times. Uh, and most epic poems on this list, I've read only once. I've never taken the plunge and reread because a lot of them are very, very long. But this is one that I return to pretty frequently, uh, which makes me think maybe it is in my top spot. So this is maybe my most reread epic poem, aside from this last one that I'm going to talk about. And in truth, this last one, the most modern epic poem that I'm gonna talk about on this list, is I think in truth my favorite. I do think it beats Child Harold, and I think it beats Dante. I have read this poem at least 10 times. Uh, it's not as long as some of the others on this list, but I think it is just utterly spellbinding. And that is The Ballad of the White Horse by G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton is more widely known uh, for his Father Brown mysteries and actually just for being a novel writer, but he did try his hand at poetry. And this is his epic poem about Alfred the Great and the Battle of Ethendon in 878 uh, when Alfred beat the Danes at Ethendon. And this is also in many ways kind of a Christian religious poem. One of the big plot points of this is that Alfred sees Mary and Mary kind of gives him the gumption to go through with his plan. This, in a similar way to the Fairy Queen, feels very fairy tale like. And it just feels as though it's something that couldn't possibly have happened. G.K. Chesterton is pretty straight up about this that he is not telling Ethendon as it actually happened. He is telling it in kind of an idealized form, a folk form and a song form. And that's what makes this one special among the others on this list. This really does feel like it was meant to be sung or at least just read aloud. Its meter really lends itself to that. Uh, and I think that was actually G.K. Chesterton's intent, was for this to feel more like a ballad, really, than an epic poem. And I think it definitely does. I tried to select a quote from this to read you, just so that you could experience its brilliance. But there are so many. This is actually one of the epic poems that I have things memorized from. I have entire stanzas memorized uh, from the Ballad of the White Horse. Uh, and so one of my favorites, it's not a full stanza, but Alfred uh, fights with a guy from Rome who still acts like ancient Rome is at its height. He says on the battlefield, not to carry him away, basically bury him where he falls. He says, bear not my body home for all the earth is Roman earth and I shall die in Rome. And I just think it's so good. The rhyme is so good uh, because there's another stanza that again, I can't remember in full. So maybe I don't remember all the stanzas. I just remember his couplets, but for the ice of the North is broken and the sea of the North comes on. It's so good. It's so good. I read this on my Kindle and that's where I continually reread it and I highlight more every time I reread it. And it's gotten to the point that basically the entire poem is highlighted. But I think this one is my favorite mostly because the subject matter really appeals to me. I love Alfred the Great, I love the Vikings. Uh, and so it's not only epic poetry, it's not only in a great rhyme scheme, but it is about one of my favorite time periods in history. And so this one just hits a lot of marks for me in a similar way to Child Harold's Pilgrimage. And so definitely my top three are The Ballad of the White Horse, uh, the Dante's Divine Comedy, and Child Harold's Pilgrimage. But their position switches pretty frequently. If I'm going based on how many times I have read a work, it's definitely The Ballad of the White Horse and then Child Harold. I've read quite a bit of over and over again. But just in terms of admiring the brilliance of the work, it's the Divine Comedy.
That's my list of my favorite epic poetry so far. There are so many more that could have been included on this list, uh, and there are so many that just were from the same time period that one time period could have deserved its entire video, specifically the medieval period, because I'm telling you, there were so many great epic poems from that time. I would love to know down below if you have read any of these. If you have a favorite epic poem that is not on this list, please give me some recommendations down below. Uh, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.